Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the MSI Z790 Gaming Pro Wi-Fi. In this video, I'm going to unbox, set up, and talk to you about this motherboard, the highlights of it, and what I've done with it, and how I built with it, and the testing that I've done with it. I'm going to show you how to update the BIOS, things that you should do in Windows if you are using it, and some of the other highlights. Now, this is actually a really affordable motherboard, which supports both 12th, 13th, and 14th gen Intel CPUs. It also has, as you can see from the box, Wi-Fi 6E capabilities, Bluetooth 5.3, and some other nice things of interest. Now, I want to show you something quickly. When I got it out of the box initially, I noticed a problem. Now, this might not happen to you, but it did to me in that the cap had come off the CPU socket. Not ideal. You could potentially damage the pins, so if that does come off, make sure you replace it. Inside the box, you get a number of other things, including M2 lockers, which are MVME drives, these Wi-Fi antennas, two SATA cables for your hard disk drives and SSDs, and then obviously the motherboard itself. So pretty understated in what's going on there, but there are a number of really nice highlights to this board, including the ability to hold three MVME SSDs. And I want to talk a bit more about that later on because they actually run really well as well. You also have, naturally, a number of stickers to peel off first and then various heat shields for those NVMe SSDs as well. You'll see the motherboard has quite a few USB ports as well as 2.5G Ethernet cable connection. There are also multiple connections for various different things including CPU fan, AIO pump headers and system fan headers, although I will note they're all in the top right, more on that in a minute. You've got two 8-pin CPU power connectors, so take note of that when you're setting up your power supply unit. I've done a wiring guide separately on PSUs if, in case you're interested. And then down at the bottom you'll see there's only one system fan header, which is something to bear in mind because I found this a bit tricky when building my system. But you will see that we also have multiple J Rainbow connectors, so JRGB for the RGB connectors. There's also two internal USB connectors and two front panel USB-A connectors, which is really unusual, especially on a board of this price. So that's very good, actually, and a wonderful addition if you've got a case with multiple ports on the front of it. You have two internal USB connectors for things like fan controllers and other things, and then these larger ports on the right-hand side for USB-A's. Now, I've recently built in the Dynamic Evo XL, and that had four USB-A front panel connectors, which is usually quite tricky, but this one would allow you to connect up the cables necessary for that. So this is a really nice addition to what is a reasonably affordable motherboard, in my opinion. Obviously, that is a very subjective thing. On the right-hand side is the front panel power connectors, and there's a guide on how to connect these up, because naturally these are a little bit fiddly. If you'd like to see a full wiring guide for your PC, because you're not too sure, I'll leave a link in the description to that because I've done a really in-depth video on how to wire all these things up. But with this case that I'm using, there's only a power switch and then power LED indicators. So the cabling for that is fairly simple if you refer to that little manual. There's actually some labeling for this directly on the motherboard just above those USB connectors as well, which you can look carefully at if you can't find that bit of paper. And it's fairly fiddly, but relatively straightforward and some people will find this the trickiest part of the build though <laughs> but you can see what that looks like when it's finished with this case now a quick note about system fan headers this is obviously going to vary depending on what you're doing but if you're using case fans so for example these fractal design ones and you want system fan headers you are quite limited for some reason they're all sort of in the top right area you can see this one below the 24 pin power connector here on the right hand side then you have that one up by the uh, cpu fan connection and then one on the bottom left so they're kind of limited but if you can daisy chain your fans together as you can with these fractal ones then it's not necessarily a problem although you will need to think about how many fans you can connect to one port which is probably going to be limited so maybe a fan controller or something else may well be necessary but it also, you need to think about this when wiring up your fans inside the case because you obviously need to make sure that cables will reach. So you can see you've got two system fan headers up here and a third one at the top. So they're mostly all bundled in the top right, which is fairly unusual and a bit tricky. Now, this is an LGA 1700 socket motherboard, which, as I said, will support Intel 12th, 13th and 14th gen 
CPUs. For this build, I initially started off with a i9-12900K, but in a second I'm going to show you that I end up using a 14th gen CPU. You probably will need a BIOS update for that, so I'm going to show you how to update the BIOS in a little while and talk about that as well. Another note I want to make is about RAM. So this will support up to four sticks of DDR5. For this, I'm using the Kingston Fury Beast RAM. However, I did hit a problem, and I wanna note this because you might have the same issue, but essentially I started off installing four sticks of RAM, and then when I went to boot the system, it wouldn't boot. And I ended up removing some of that RAM and trying just two sticks instead. And that's usually a bit more stable with DDR5. And as I said, I also swapping out the CPU. So I also did a BIOS update. And BIOS updates sometimes also help with the stability of RAM. So a bit more on that later on. But if you do find you're using four sticks and it's not booting, it could be that you need two. So just try two instead. In this motherboard, you'd need to use A2 and B2, which is the second slot in from the left and the fourth one over. So doing that, it was stable. And as I'll show you later on, it did recognize both sticks in the BIOS. But one thing I found is if I used all four, it just wouldn't boot or it wouldn't recognize all the sticks. I also have noted that you do need to push the RAM in a little bit harder than usual on this motherboard. Make sure it clips in, but I had to make sure it was fully seated in. So quite a bit of force in order to get it in, which is also unusual but it wasn't detected properly otherwise. There are three NVMe SSD ports hidden under these various heat shields over here. For this, I'm using two WD Black's SN850 and a Crucial P3 drive. Under there, you'll notice there is a thermal pad with a sticker on top of it. Don't forget to remove that. I've done a video on why these heat shields are actually really important, as are those thermal pads, and why you should keep the stickers on your NVMe SSDs as well. And I'll link to those videos in the description because it is important. The top port actually has a little clip on it, which allows you to install that drive really easily because it's just a little plastic cue latch, which is basically just a little clip that will just turn around and click that into place. Really nice, but you do need to make sure that you put the heat shield back on and then it's secured down like that. The other drives actually are attached with the screws in the heat shield, so they pass through the heat shielding and then connect up to the standoff that's on the motherboard. The installation, as you can see, is fairly straightforward. I have obviously sped it up because it did take a little bit of time. But one of the things that's really interesting about this is historically, if you installed this many drives, it may have affected the speed of them and the performance of them. Sometimes it could actually negate the overall performance of the drives by reducing the number of lanes that some of them get. But actually, from my testing, all three drives run at the right speed, so at the maximum speeds for those drives which is fantastic. So you can populate all three and still get maximum Gen 4 speed. So this is a Gen 4 motherboard with Gen 4 support for those various different drives. Sadly, despite the new generation, there is no support for PCIe Gen 5 NVMe SSDs on this motherboard. Now this is a socket LGA 1700 motherboard. So quick note on that, you will need LGA 1700 standoffs and brackets. Most modern motherboards include that now, but if you have an older AIO or CPU cooler that you're trying to use, you might need to get an adapter for this. I'm using the Fractal Lumen S24 V2 RGB for this, which will work fine with it. But as I said, you may need to watch out for that because sometimes older ones won't fit. So if you're trying to use an LGA 1200 socket adapter, that won't work. You need 1700. So that's the finished motherboard built. Although as a note, I'm going to swap the CPU out in a minute. And then the installation process for that is pretty standard. Just don't forget all that wiring. Now, I will note that that front panel USB-A cable is a bit tricky in this position in this case, but that's obviously specific to this case because it's now at the bottom and is very tight against the bottom of the case. So something to keep in mind there. So now we're all set up and built in the Fractal North, which I've done a build guide on separately, if you're curious. And you can see it with the Lumin S24 RGB here as well. So initially, as I said, four sticks of RAM in there. It looks like it's working fine, but then I couldn't boot. So more on that in a little while, but the finished product looks pretty nice. Nice looking motherboard. And it's got some other treats in it. As I said, those include the NVMe speeds, which is actually really surprising. So when it's powered on, one of the first things to do is to think about BIOS updates. Although a lot of people will tell you not to do BIOS updates, the more recent ones will allow some stability 
And one thing to bear in mind as well is if you want to use 14th gen CPUs, you probably need to do this. So you go to the motherboard website and then find the latest BIOS update. This is the current one for me now, but yours may well be newer if you're watching this in the future. Download that and then we need to extract it onto an external drive so that we can put it onto the new system. I'm assuming that you've managed to get the internet working. If you haven't, stick with me because I'll show you that in a second. If not, you can do this on another machine. Now, once you've done that, you can then put it onto that drive and put it into the port on the motherboard that's marked for BIOS flashback. And there's a button for that. So you could possibly do this without these next steps. But the easiest way to do it is to turn the PC on and then mash the delete key on your keyboard until you get into the BIOS. There's a tool in there that will enable you to just flash the BIOS update with relative ease. You can also see what BIOS you're running. So you can see it in the top right. So you can see the current BIOS version. Mine was May 2023, for example. And then you just click on the M flash button at the bottom. It'll reboot again. It'll take you into this M flash setting. Just find the BIOS file from your external drive and then click yes. And that'll go through and install the new version. Now, obviously, make sure not to power your system off at any point during this. That's where it can go wrong and you could end up bricking it. But this BIOS update I found to be stable and obviously also gives improvements that include allowing you to run the new gen CPUs on it. So really important if you want to use 14th gen. And then we just boot up and go to Windows, assuming you've done all the installation process. And next is my recommendations for Wi-Fi updates. So if you find your Wi-Fi is not working, if you head over to the motherboard website on a different machine, I've done a guide separately on this in case you get stuck. But what you can do is download the Wi-Fi driver. So you're looking for the Wi-Fi ones. It, again, extract them to an external drive and then pop them back into the machine in question. And what you need to do is just run these. So this is important for doing this. You might be able to get away with using Ethernet. So I could use Ethernet on this machine and then download the Wi-Fi drivers. Alternatively, you might need to download Wi-Fi drivers from some other machine. It can be a pain. But once you've done that, you can then just go through and install them. You can see on here that the network's not working. So the Wi-Fi as standard just won't work out of the box. So you do need to download the drivers. Now, usually you just go to the folder you've extracted, find the relevant EXE and launch it. And that would then go about installing it. But actually, this is a little bit different because there isn't anything in this folder to do that. So... What you need to do instead is to use the Windows tools at your disposal to do this. So we hit the Windows Start button and search for Device Manager. Open up Device Manager and then you're looking for the Network Controller under the other devices here. Right click that and then click on to Device Drivers and then look for the drivers specifically. Find it on the relevant drive. You can find that folder that we've put it on and then you can allow your machine to find the drivers necessary and go through the installation process. Once that's done, it should install the drivers relatively easily, and then you'll have access to Wi-Fi drivers. I've done a guide separately on other things to do once you've built your machine. I'll link to it in the description. It should be pretty helpful as well. Now, if we go back into the BIOS briefly, I want to show you that you can see that both sticks of RAM are working, so they are recognized. And you can use this setting for XMP profile on the top left. And that's important because that'll make sure the RAM's running at the right speed. So with XMP turned on, it's now 6,000 megahertz, which is what it should be instead of the default. You can also turn on Game Boost for your CPU to give a performance increase in there as well. So that's one other setting to do. And that's on the easy mode, so it's basically straight when you get into the BIOS. If you go into the advanced mode and then the other settings, you can also see the PCIe settings in here. So for if any reason all of your NVMEs aren't recognized, you can go in there and then check the modes. I'd also recommend enabling resizable bar support that'll improve your graphics card support. But you can see for each of the M2 slots, you can choose whether auto or gen four. So if you have trouble and one of the drivers isn't being recognized, it might be worth trying those different settings to see if that helps recognize them. You can also look at the hardware monitor in here and see the performance of your system and adjust the fan speeds if necessary. You can see that both CPU fan and pump fan are both connected in this instance. So that will ensure there's no complaints from the BIOS about those fans and how they're running. So it's worth just having a little check in there and making sure the system is recognizing those. 
Now, once you're in Windows, I'd also recommend using Intel's Extreme Tuning Utility. And if you go into the Advanced View settings on this, you can see not only the system performance and make sure everything's running as it should be. So this is another way to look at the setup. You'll see, for example, the RAM is noted as running at 6,000 mega transfers. And that's on the right hand side there. So we know that XMP is working properly and you can see everything else is also connected as it should be. And we've got some information on what's what. And then you can also use this tool as a stress test. So this does a stress test on your CPU to make sure nothing's problematic. There's no thermal throttling happening or anything else. I've done a video separately on thermal throttling and the things to consider there. But you'll notice that Hardware Info 64 is on the right hand side. I also use this to test that the M2 ports were running at the right speed and getting the right number of lanes. So all told, a pretty good board for the money, pretty capable board with lots of highlights to it. And the end result is a nice PC, which is running very smoothly. Hope you found this video useful. If you did, check out the links in the description to other videos related to this. And thanks very much for watching. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.